Welcome to section 3 of the parasites. This is our overview figure showing the parasites you need to know for step 1. In this lecture, we will be talking about the third GI protozoan, Cryptosporidium. This story takes place after a violent earthquake. You can see the quake has broken a city's water pipe here. You can also see that a new river has developed below the destruction of the water pipe leaking. Unfortunately, the earthquake also unearthed some coffins, or crypts. These crypts are releasing spores into the atmosphere. These crypts releasing spores stands for Cryptosporidium. Now let's look closely at those crypts. These coffins have a hard exterior, kind of like a cyst. Cryptosporidium will form hardened cysts to protect it while in between hosts. When it's time to infect something, the cyst will open up and release sporozoites. So hardened crypts releasing spores stands for cysts releasing sporozoites. Now city plumbers have come to fix the broken water pipe, but they did not expect to encounter these open crypts and those spores in the air have started poisoning the poor workers. Look at this guy's poor skin growing those appendages. The skin has an epithelium, so the appendages growing on his epithelium represents the fact that the spores will infect the GI epithelium, and in there, the sporozoites will replicate. Unfortunately, none of the plumbers are faring well when exposed to the crypt spores. In fact, being startled by the spores in the air, these two plumbers have been knocked into these open crypts. One of them has inadvertently pushed a coffin into the river when he fell into it. This represents the fact that after replicating, cryptosporidium will form new cysts. This is pretty frightening for the infected plumber, so he yells, uh-oh. This will help you remember that the cysts formed are oo cysts. Now once cryptosporidium forms new cysts, it will shed them in the stool. To help you remember this, we have included this hard coffin flowing down the river, so you can see this has come full circle. The cysts released the sporozoites, infected the GI epithelium, created new oo cysts, which were then shed in the stool. So how do patients infected with cryptosporidium present? Well, in reality, the only people who have symptoms are immunocompromised patients. To help you remember this, we have included this poor civilian in the stretcher. The earthquake has injured lots of people in various ways. So, injured man in stretcher stands for symptoms occurring in immunocompromised patients. The patients you should be thinking about in particular are those with AIDS. To help you remember this, we have included a band-aid on this injured man. Now, AIDS patients are especially susceptible to cryptosporidium infections when their CD4 counts fall below 100. To help you remember this, we have included a sign on the pipe that reads 100 miles per hour. I guess labeling the speed at which the water travels through the pipe is useful information to the plumbers. So again, injured man and the 100 miles per hour sign stands for symptoms in AIDS when CD4 counts fall below 100. Now this poor guy on the stretcher is super sick. He's even vomiting. This represents the vomiting that can occur in AIDS patients. Most notably, however, infection causes diarrhea. Notice this big old river formed when the earthquake broke all the pipes? This nasty river of water represents diarrhea. So cryptosporidium infections cause diarrhea in AIDS patients. Now when the sick man vomited, he kicked the protein drink out of the hand of a medic. You can see the protein shake falling to the ground. That medic should have set the shake down before he started lifting the sick guy. But anyways, that protein shake represents protozoa. Cryptosporidium, after all, is one of the protozoa that infects the GI tract. Now there are various ways to diagnose cryptosporidium infections. One way is to biopsy the intestinal epithelium. We represented this idea by the scientist scooping up some of the dirt at the river's edge. In her left hand is a vial she will place the sample in. The reason she's here is because the city sent some scientists to research the area following the unexpected earthquake. Maybe so they can help prepare for the next earthquake. And the river represents the intestinal tract. So gathering some dirt from the river's edge is kind of like a biopsy of the intestinal epithelium. Now one of the other scientists has noticed some precious gems washing up on the dirt from the river. We like to use gems to represent antigens, which is one of the ways to diagnose cryptosporidium. You take a sample of the stool and, and perform an antigen test, looking for evidence of cryptosporidium antigens. This third scientist was going to test some of the dirt by placing it in a vial with some acid. Unfortunately, the reaction was so abrupt that the vial of acid exploded all over him so fast he couldn't react. This represents diagnosing using an acid fast stain. This is an acid fast stain revealing cryptosporidium oosis, which you can see here and each one of these contains sporozoites, as we discussed before. Now let's talk about treatment. All the spores shooting out of the crypts attracted this underground monster. It's a nidus worm and it can smell the spores and it wants to come eat them up. This nidus worm stands for nidazoxanide. In a game called StarCraft, there is something called a nidus worm. A nidus worm looks like this. Starting from the left, you can see the nidus worm, which tunnels to the enemy's base, then the nidus worm unloads creatures to attack. You don't need to know anything about that game, you just need to know that this is a nidus worm. Nidus for nidazoxanide, which is a good treatment for cryptosporidium infections. Another treatment is paramomycin. To represent this, we have included a pair of mice. Looks like they are trying to dig into that crypt. So pair of mice stands for paramomycin as treatment. 
The best treatment of all, however, is never needing a treatment and just preventing the infection in the first place. Cities can do this by filtering their water supply. To help you remember filtration, we've included this steel grate. This grate acts to filter the water, preventing large objects from passing into the city's water supply. For example, a big crypt or coffin will be unable to pass through these holes in the grate, so the civilians won't need to deal with the crypts or the spores they release. So again, prevent infection by filtering the water. Now that we've covered all the items in the image, let's do a question to apply this. A 29-year-old man with stabilized and medicated HIV presents for a routine follow-up visit. The patient, patient A, endorses feeling in good health and does not have any concerns. Blood tests were ordered, revealing a CD4 T-cell count of 1,100 cells per cubic millimeter, unchanged from the previous visit. The physician also treats the patient's life partner, patient B, who also has AIDS. Last week, the physician treated patient B for a cryptosporidium infection. Patient A and patient B both drink from the same water source. Regarding patient A, which of the following is most likely true? A. He is likely to experience diarrhea soon. B. Prophylactic nitazoxanide is warranted. C. Unprotected intercourse will increase cryptosporidium risk. Or D. He may have ingested oocysts from the same water source. Hopefully from the question stem, you notice that patient A has well-controlled HIV. After all, his CD4 count is 1100, which is high. Plus, the level hasn't changed from the previous visit, which indicates it's stable. The point is that patient A, while having HIV, does not have AIDS and is unlikely to experience an AIDS-defining infection. Conversely, patient B has full-blown AIDS because patient B was treated for a cryptosporidium infection. With these facts in mind, the correct answer is choice D. He, patient A, may have ingested oocysts from the same water source. Recall that cryptosporidium infections occur only when the CD4 count drops below 100. And patient A has a high CD4 count of 1100, making a cryptosporidium infection unlikely, even though he likely ingested the same oocyst as patient B. Recall the people in the stretchers indicate AIDS patients, and the speed of the water through the pipes is indicated by this sign here, which reads, speed is 100 miles per hour, helping you remember that cryptosporidium infections only occur when CD4 counts drop below 100. Choice A is wrong because this implies patient A will develop a cryptosporidium infection, which we do not expect. Choice B is wrong because cryptosporidium treatment is not given without high suspicion of an active infection, which we do not believe. Although if you were to treat the infection, nitazoxanide is a good idea. Finally, choice C is wrong because cryptosporidium is not transmitted sexually. It's transmitted through water contaminated with cryptosporidium oocysts. And that should be all you need to know about cryptosporidium.